So today I'm going to talk about uh, some perspectives on statistical models uh, versus machine learning, and I'm going to jump right into one of the key issues, uh, which is classification versus prediction. Uh, when you see a link at the end of this talk to the slides, and when you get to the slides, you can go to links such as here, and that will show you uh, my blog article about classification versus prediction, which is far and away my most popular blog article. And this is something that a lot of people have misunderstood. Classification and prediction are two distinctly different tasks. Uh, so what is a classifier? So a classifier is a method that provides only categorical predictions. And so uh, a, category, a classifier is a forced choice, uh, which I call um, a premature decision, because uh, a decision can't really be made until you have a utility function, and a classifier is trying to make a decision such as diseased or not, um, are you going to die or you're not going to die uh, as a forced choice without uh, knowing the consequences that you capture in a utility function? And because of the way classification is set up, uh, classification is really very inconsistent with optimal decision making um, unless you really know the true patient specific utilities and you incorporate those in the ana analysis. Uh, so why is this such a problem? It's because machine learning really started off on the wrong foot, and uh, classifiers were easier to develop than, say, probability models. And so because classifiers were easier to develop, they started to be used even for many applications where classification is not the appropriate task. So when is classification an appropriate task? Well, it's when you have a deterministic outcome that occurs frequently. And so the classic example would be you're recognizing letters of the alphabet, you're recognizing handwriting, you're recognizing speech, uh, self-driving car, uh, any sort of visual pattern recognition, especially uh, you're trying to recognize something that really is, is mainly deterministic and it occurs frequently. So classification could be appropriate, but the, the general way to know that classification is appropriate is if you did not do classification, but you instead developed a probability model and the probabilities were all very close to zero or one. So if you see your probabilities are close to zero or one, that means you have a fairly deterministic problem and a classifier is going to be appropriate for that problem. Predictions are separate from decisions, which is why I like predictive modeling so much. You can let somebody else deal with the consequences. The predictions can be used by any decision maker because the predictions have disconnected the utility function. Uh, and when an outcome incidence is near zero or one, you have to deal with tendencies. So if you're predicting a rare disease where the probability of disease for most people is close to zero, you can't really predict disease presence or absence. A classifier is an inappropriate tool in that context. So you can only predict tendencies, which would be probabilities. The probability that someone has disease is 0 0.001. Uh, but machine learning too often uses classification. And because classification doesn't work well when you have uh, an outcome incidence near zero or one, uh, many machine learning advocates say that you need to discard observations in order to get class balance so that you could use a class classifier. Well, anyone in clinical epidemiology or biostatistics or statistics will know that any data analytic strategy that requires you to remove observations for the strategy to work is a bad strategy. You just automatically know there's a, there's a misunderstanding somewhere if you have to discard data to make it work. So uh, rare outcomes, you, you analyze tendencies, you don't, you don't use classifiers. So a classification, a classifier is a method that provides only categorical prediction. Oops, already got that one. Um, then we move to a, a different topic, which is sample size. Now this will seem like an odd topic to talk about with regard to machine learning. But there's been a very big misunderstanding in, in research that people think you can apply very complex machine learning algorithms to a problem and you can find really hard to find signals in a very complex situation. 
and and that's really not the case. And so there's some various things to know about sample size. Is uh, the first thing is when you're developing a complex uh, predictive uh, uh, system. Uh, if it's a very complex analytical method, it needs more data than a simple analytic method does. So this is really summarized beautifully in this paper by van der Ploeg and, and Austin and Steyerberg called Mod Modern Modeling Techniques or Data Hungry. So they found that for a typical statistical model, uh, if you have P predictors and they're all linear, uh, this rule of thumb that you need at least a sample size of 20 times the number of predictors that you have as candidate predictors, we know that's a very rough rule of thumb, but it's, it's close to being okay. So you need about 20 times as many predictors uh, it, it, to be your sample size or larger for your statistical model to be reliable. What they found that was for, for machine learning techniques, you needed about 10 times as large a sample size. So the machine learning method needed about 200 times the number of parameters that you're potentially estimating. Uh, a sample size needed to be 200 times, say the number of events in a binary outcome for the machine learning to be uh, accurate. If you're doing recursive partitioning or CART, they, they really couldn't find a sample size that would make a tree, a single tree accurate. So the sample size needed for a regression tree or recursive partitioning is more than 200 times the number of candidate uh, predictors. So that's a little bit frightening, uh, but you can look at simpler situations to really know what your limitations are. So you need to know about what is the minimum sample size for something very easy because as I'll say again in a moment, if you're trying to do something complicated, that's gonna only be harder than doing something easy. So what's easy? So easy is you're estimating a single correlation coefficient. That's at the heart of looking for association and developing predictions. What is the sample size needed to estimate a single product moment linear correlation coefficient? Well, it's 400. That will estimate the correlation coefficient within a margin of error of plus or minus 0.1. So if you uh, estimate a correlation coefficient uh, of, um, let's say, 0.7, the confidence interval may be 0.6 to 0.8 uh, with an N of 400. So if you have fewer than 400, your margin of error will be larger and it will often be too large. So Point one in estimating something that goes from minus one to one is not asking a lot. And that still takes 400, and that's with a single feature. If you're estimating the intercept in a logistic model, that takes a minimum sample size of 96. So this is the case where P is equal to zero. You have no covariates, no predictors. You're just trying to estimate disease prevalence. That's the same thing as just fitting an intercept in the logistic model. Um, an N of 96 will give you a margin of error plus or minus 0.1 in estimating a probability of disease. When you add covariates, the sample size needed has to be larger than that. Now, why is this so important? Well, you see papers coming out using machine learning. One that, one that came out a few years ago had about, I think it was 46 uh, patients, about half of them had cancer and they used uh, 2,000 protein expressions to predict uh, the outcome of cancer. So the, the number of predictors there was 2,000, the total sample size was 47. So if you cannot estimate the intercept in a logistic model with 47 um, patients, you're not gonna be able to estimate the effect of 2,000 proteins, it's just not going to work. What if you're in a linear model, you wanna estimate the residual standard deviation? Well, it takes 70 subjects just to estimate that within a multiplicative margin of error, that's also called the full change margin of error of 1.2. So that's not asking a lot. So just to estimate your residual variance, it's going to take, say, 70 subjects. If you're doing a classifier and you want to estimate the misclassification probability, no matter how complex your classifier is, that's going to take a minimum of 96 subjects to estimate the classification accuracy to within 0.1, and 0.1 is not an adequate margin of error. If you wanted plus or minus 0.05, uh, 
this would be four times as large. What about the requirement uh, of selecting the right variables? If you have a large number of features, there is no sample size that will allow you to select the right variables until you get to infinity. So the idea that a feature selection algorithm has a high probability of selecting the right features, when you have a finite sample, you can pretty much forget about it. And people are wasting a lot of research dollars in claiming to be able to select the right proteins, the right genes, the right biomarkers, and it's really an impossible task. Uh, if you want to estimate the misclassification probability with feature selection or a large number of candidate features, the sample size for that has to be much, much, much greater than 96 subjects. And if the sample size is not large in comparison with the number of features, it may be insufficient for everything else, including choosing the optimum penalty, estimating the model performance, estimating variable importance measures. Now, this is true whether you're using machine learning or statistical modeling. So the, the overall way to say that is if your sample says is too small to do something simple, it is too small to do something complex. But what we're seeing is people thinking machine learning is going to find information in the data that we normally would not be able to find. And that's just simply not the case in most situations. You're going to make the sample size requirement uh, bigger. So I have this blog article, uh, which is a roadmap uh, to help you decide should you be using machine learning or statistical modeling and what's the difference. So I wanted to go down some of the points in that blog article. Uh, what is a statistical model? Well, it's a probability model for data. And most all statistical models that we have have a default assumption of additivity. We tend to favor main effects in, in a regression model. So we are assuming by default that the predictor effects are additive in the vast majority of regression models. This doesn't mean you have to omit interactions, but that's the default assumption. So if you have interactions, they generally have to be pre-specified when you're doing a statistical model. The model may be very high dimensional if penalization is used. In statistical models, it's extremely easy to allow for nonlinearity. We're still, still seeing papers coming out comparing uh, machine learning with statistical models where the machine learning author claimed that regression assumes linearity. Well, that hasn't been true for many, many decades, probably 50 years or more. Uh, statistical models do suffer from assumptions, and this is where semi-parametric models are a great benefit because they have far fewer assumptions. Uh, regression models are not machine learning, although they do fall under the, under the uh, term statistical learning. So one thing that we're seeing now that's very curious is as a reviewer for medical journal articles, I see people uh, submitting articles where they say they've done machine learning uh, and what they really did was logistic re regression. So they're acting as though uh, if, if they just use the word machine learning somewhere in their paper, the, jour the journal reviewers are going to suspend all of their disbelief and they're going to give it an easy peer review. And that is actually what happens in many cases. Just the sheer mention of machine learning, the reviewers just give it an automatic pass, which is starting to change. Uh, but they are, they are using false advertising and they're just doing logistic regression. So I like this quote by Juan Miguel La Vista that says, when we raise money, it's artificial intelligence. When we hire, is machine learning, and when we do the work, it's logistic regression. Now, Martin Van Smeden has actually put together a, a video that, that actually has the sound of machine learning posing as logistic regression. So I want to play that very brief video for you. If I can just go to that. So this is this is logistic regression posing as machine learning.
So I, I wish people didn't play games, but in in the peer review literature, we're seeing a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of games played. Uh, what is machine learning? Um, it doesn't have a probability model for data. It's very empirical and it doesn't favor additivity. And if you had to pick one thing that distinguishes machine learning from statistical models, it would probably be this one thing. There's no predisposition or favoritism for additivity in machine learning algorithms. And they're, they're algorithms, they're not probability models. And related to not favoring additivity, they can deal with higher order interactions. Now, keep in mind, the sample size needed to estimate an interaction is, in the best possible case, is four times as large as the sample size needed to estimate a main effect. So you have to have enormous samples for this to actually work. Uh, machine learning does allow for nonlinearity, usually automatically. But whereas uh, statistical models suffer from making assumptions, machine learner learning suffers from not making assumptions. And that sounds like an odd thing to mention, but it's a real problem because if you don't make assumptions, you're not going to favor additivity. And if you don't favor additivity, you're going to need a much stronger signal or a much larger sample size because of the effective number of parameters you're estimating. So what are examples of machine learning? Neural networks. Uh, which have been relabeled uh, deep learning, and that was strictly marketing because uh, neural nets came out decades ago and were hyped as being the, the cure for everything. And then that didn't work out so well. And then they came out about 10 years later and were hyped. And then people, people found it didn't work as advertised. So when it came out the third time, it had a third birth. The third time neural nets were born, uh, the people in the field said, we need to call it something new because people will not trust us anymore, so we're going to relabel it deep learning. That means nothing different than neural nets, although many of the algorithms have been tuned and developed to work better, uh, how, it, how it uses tuning parameters and how they do uh, penalization, but it's still neural networks. Uh, recursive partitioning or CART is a machine learning technique. Random forest is a machine learning technique support vector machines. So when is uh, machine learning uh, most applicable? Well, it's most applicable when you have a signal to noise ratio that's very high. Uh, so for example, your residual variance is low, your, your true R squared is high. So when is the signal to noise ratio high? Well, in visual and sound pattern recognition, it's very high. When is the signal to noise ratio infinite? Well, when you're playing games like Go or chess, there is no noise in these games. They have rules that cannot be broken. The, the winner is assessed with 100% accuracy. So that's an infinite signal to noise ratio. And you, you can safely estimate a large number of parameters when you have a high signal to noise ratio. Um, also, when you have unlimited training, so when when you're training to beat humans at Go or chess, as was done with machines, you can have unlimited training and the winner is known every time you play a game. Uh, machine learning is also good when you have very large sample size, when the outcome is almost deterministic. So if you have two identical subjects, such as let's say identical twins are almost identical, uh, if the two twins always have the same outcome, like if one has ovarian cancer, the other one has ovarian cancer, then you have a deterministic outcome and things are going to be much clearer uh, when you don't have a lot of biologic variability. Uh, statistical models are best when you have a lower signal to noise ratio, such as diagnosing ovarian cancer from clinical signs, symptoms, or biomarkers. Now, just think about taking uh, a thousand protein expressions uh, from a from a serum sample and trying to develop a predictive model for ovarian cancer, that is much, much, much harder than recognizing letters of the alphabet, recognizing sounds, or, or creating a self-driving car. The signal to noise ratio you're trying to find here in all of these protein expressions or gene expressions is so much smaller than it is in physical problems of such as visual pattern recognition. Uh, signal, uh, statistical models are best when an outcome is stochastic. 
when the effects are predominantly additive or when the sample size is lower. As I have this blog article, Is Medicine Mesmerized by Machine Learning? And um, in that article, I go through um, a, a lot of examples and, and I show some examples of statistical models that have been ignored, even though they're great models, and they were ignored because they were not using any new technology. So there's this thing that happens when a new technology comes about uh, that people get all excited about the technology and they forget about the older technologies. Uh, so I go into examples of that in this blog article. Um, and I, I go through some uh, machine learning algorithms that have been touted as accurate that really are not very accurate. Um, and then I close this article with an example of uh, a statistical model. This is in uh, critically ill, frail, elderly patients. Uh, this is just an example of what is the opposite of a black box. So in machine learning, it's often very hard to interpret the results. Uh, and sometimes you can't even describe the results in a journal article that you're submitting. Whereas with a statistical model, uh, it's really the complete opposite of a black box. So just to give this example, uh, you have certain admission diagnostic categories that you put the patient in, uh, A, B, C, D, uh, e, and then you have the age. These are patients between the age 85 and 100. We have the Glasgow Coma Score, acute physiology score, activities of daily living, whether they had a weight loss in the last year. Each of these things gives you points, and you can see those points exactly how they're calculated. You look those points up on the nomogram axis, and then you add all those points together. And from that, you not only get a single prediction, you get a whole whole a list of predictions. What is for that patient the one-year survival probability, the two-year survival probability, the 10th percentile of survival time, the 25th percentile, the median survival time, 75th percentile, 90th percentile. So this is the, the example to me of the opposite of a black box. And it's really a validated model that's highly accurate uh, and anyone using the model can see exactly what are the inputs and how are the outputs created. At the bottom of this is a bunch of relevant articles that, that survey the literature in terms of what we're learning about how machine learning performs in medical applications, um, and then um, how does it compare with statistical models. So there's a lot of editorials here, so some really excellent articles I would encourage you uh, to look at. So where things stand at the moment is that um, up until about three to four years ago, I was watching a lot of excitement about machine learning. Uh, I saw this in medical journals and I saw this on Twitter and elsewhere. And in the last two years, there's been a noticeable change where clinical researchers are starting to see through some of the hype. Now they're seeing their places for machine learning where really great results can be obtained, especially if the people uh, doing the uh, analysis are real experts in machine learning and are working with subject matter experts and they understand what confounding means. So there's some definitely good work being done, but clinical researchers are really starting to see that much of the results of machine learning was hyped and now we have multiple comparative studies that are showing that the gains from machine learning in low signal to noise ratio settings is quite modest. So here are a few examples of machine learning fiascos. These are fun to look at. Um, and so this one was um, an article by John Zeck where he really went to a machine learning algorithm that was doing a visual analysis of a chest X-ray. And the goal in the algorithm was to identify the outline of the heart and to classify the patient about whether, um, or to actually give a probability prediction of whether the patient has an enlarged heart or cardiomegaly. So this particular patient was given a probability estimate of having an enlarged heart of 0.752. So what Zek did that's a very fun exercise is you can reverse engineer 
uh, a machine learning algorithm to find out what the inputs, which inputs are getting weight. So when you look at all these different regions of a chest X-ray, first of all, you find that some regions are getting weight that are not in the heart. So if you're trying to identify an enlarged heart and you're, you're looking at things that are outside of the heart, you know, that's the first signal that maybe something is a bit strange about this algorithm. But the real clue, uh, and it's really a lesson to be learned about bias um, and measurement issues, is a good deal of weight was given to this section here. And why was it given weight? It's not in the heart, but it has a word in it. And the word it has is portable. So this was a portable X-ray, and a portable X-ray is given to a patient who is too ill to leave their hospital bed to go to radiology. So the X-ray machine is brought to their room, and to to need a portable X-ray, you need to be very sick. Um, and so the machine learning algorithm was giving a lot of weight to this word portable in in its algorithm for predicting outcomes and. I don't think that's the sort of feature that you want to be giving weight to. It may be predictive, but the chance of that actually being transportable to another hospital or other health system is, is not very great. And that relates to this really excellent paper. Um, this was an in-depth analysis using the entire electronic medical record to predict patient outcomes. And then going back and sort of reverse engineering to find out which features are used uh, in the machine learning algorithm. And what they found was um, that uh, they had a lot of medical test results in the electronic health record. So you have white blood count, you have cholesterol, you have all sorts of blood workup. Then you have other tests such as x-rays and cardiovascular tests. And then you know from the electronic medical record whether a test was ordered. Well, the machine learning algorithm, after looking at thousands of variables, it ended up only using the physician behavior. It used whether or not tests were ordered, and it never actually needed to use the test result. Now, that is really a problem. So you might be able to predict a patient outcome in that hospital because it may be that when patients are dying, physicians quit ordering a certain test, or when patients are close to dying, they may order more of a certain kind of test. Uh, but the physician behavior is going to change from one medical system to another, um, and that will not transport. Whereas if you use the results of the test, uh, the actual cholesterol value, and not just whether or not the cholesterol test was ordered, uh, you're likely to get a transportable algorithm because the meaning of cholesterol is pretty much the same in every health system. So you have to be careful which signals are actually being used. And in this case, it was only the physician behavior characteristics that were being picked up by the machine learning algorithm. Derek Lowe is someone who writes really interesting blog articles uh, for the journal Science Translational Medicine. And he wrote this really great article about a, a much hyped paper that was in science that used really complicated data to try to predict whether a certain chemical reaction would occur. So these are not the kind of data we're usually uh, working with. These are more molecular le level data and uh, looking at chemical bonds and so on. And so this, this group uh, apparently found, using the machine learning algorithm, a very accurate classifier for whether a certain chemical reaction is going to occur. Um, but what happened was another researcher came along, um, and uh, these um, researchers at University of California, San Francisco, did another analysis where they simulated data like the first analysis, but the way they simulated the data was they simulated it so that all of the results are random. So all of the chemical uh, reaction outcomes were just random numbers. They were able to get with random numbers almost the same accuracy as the original paper was claiming to get with real data. So anytime you can get the same accuracy with random numbers, as people claim with real data, it almost always means they're overfitting. There's also a serious problem of potential um, uh, cherry picking, potential fraud, although you can't prove it from the analysis, 
but the way they did a holdout sample makes it looks like they they picked a one third of the data to leave out that made the results look better. Um, and so the validation seems to be biased, although you cannot prove it from this. But I would encourage you to read Derek Lowe's uh, blog article about this. Uh, now, on a different note, Norm Matloff, who was a very interesting person who is truly a computer scientist and statistician, he is training in both fields, he wrote this article uh, showing that neural networks are essentially polynomial regression. And he even shows some advantages that polynomial regression has over machine learning uh, because of certain uh, simplifications or penalizations that are more natural to do. So I would encourage you to look at that. It's a pretty provocative article, but very, very interesting. So um, I appreciate your listening. Look forward to questions. And um, there is more information, and you can click on the links from the slides that, that I just showed you. This is the link to the slides, and it has links to the other material and the blog articles. So thank you again for inviting me and for having me uh, present to the conference. And uh, I hope you find the material either interesting or useful or both.